Good morning, everybody. Here we are in our fourth uh, segment of Coffee with Rob, and the idea was uh, generated by a collaborative between myself and Daryl Lawrence at NAD, where we thought it'd be a good opportunity to be casual and offer parenting tips on important topics that are, are things we discuss quite a bit in the power of parents. So this is our uh, fourth installment of the Coffee with Rob series. Uh, my name is Rob Teresi. I'm a professor and psychologist at Penn State University. And I've been, for those of you who are not familiar with me, I've been uh, conducting parent uh, research for uh, close to 35 years. I've developed uh, brief parent-based interventions that have been written up in the Surgeon General's report as one of the two most efficacious intervention approaches for, for younger kids and reducing harm uh, around drinking and substance abuse. I've also, my materials are also listed in National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcohol Wilson's AIM uh, College Matrix for uh, eff efficacious free parent-based interventions. Okay, so with that uh, out of the way, the first thing I want to do is I want to continue to thank our sponsors and our, our lead sponsor is Nationwide. Nationwide uh, doesn't uh, sponsor me in particular, but it does help uh, MAD and brings uh, resources to MED so that they can do things like this today. And uh, they can also help distribute the materials for power parents. So thank you very much Nationwide for your support of MED. Okay, with, with that uh, being said, today's uh, uh, topic is uh, peer pressure, what every parents wanna know. And so what I wanna do is I wanna start off first by just talking a little bit about peers and, and how they particularly could have some influence on our, on our kids. And then with that, some tips for parents to help maybe uh, relieve or, or weaken some of that peer influence. So I wanna start first with, when we think of peer influence, um, we, we really think about the, the student that hands our kid a drink and says, oh yeah, you should drink this, it's okay, everybody's doing it, or something like that, where it's a direct peer influence. And that's uh, clearly one way that peers can influence our kids, but it's probably not the most impactful way, even though it sounds like it should be where somebody hands your kid a drink or encourages them to drink in person. One of the biggest influences that we know about peer influence is what we think other people are doing, other people our age. Are, so, so if I were a teenager, the biggest source of peer influence is what I think other kids are doing, what's considered to be typical or normal. And the one thing we've learned from scientific studies is that young people typically overestimate the number of other young people who drink alcohol at their age. And it doesn't matter what age they are, they tend to overestimate. So if they're 16 or 17 year olds, and the data show that maybe one in three 16 year olds has had a drink outside the home in the past year. They won't think it's one in three. They'll think it's probably more like 60 or 70%. Why they overestimate, it's hard to say. You know, we don't, we don't have a lot of data that really comes up to play as to the reasons why most people overestimate, it, but they think that there are more people that go along. For example, if they were to happen to go to a party where there's alcohol and there's a lot of people at the party, they would overestimate the number of people that were probably at that party too. They would say, oh, there was a lot of people at the party. But in reality, not everybody goes to that same party from the school and not everybody's really doing the things that we see. So we commonly, when we, we look at, we come in and we do an assessment at a school, we ask the students to tell us how many students they think or what percentage of students they think are drinking alcohol. And they commonly give a number like 60 or 70% or something like that. Then we actually survey to look at how many students are actually drinking alcohol, and it's usually lower, maybe like 20 or 30 percent. So one of the things that uh, uh, psychologists and, and health professionals do is they try and correct the misperception and bring it more in line with what's actually going on. So that's a big way that peers are influenced, is if you think everybody's doing this and you think everybody's doing okay, then your perception is that, yeah, it's okay, it's safe, everybody's doing it, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So that's a big source of influence. We call it normative influence. It means we think it's normative or normal that people are doing these things. 
So um, I'll get to the tips in a moment. So that's one way. So it's a direct way of handing a drink. But if you think more people are doing something and that it's actually normal and abnormal not to do it, you're going to be pressured in a way to doing it or trying. So that's one form of peer pressure that we, uh, we, we, we see. Another thing is that to consider for parents is how our teens make friends. And there's a whole science on friendship formation. And a lot of times parents will say, well, my kid's not into that kind of thing. Um, it's another kid that's maybe not so good that's influencing my kid. Well, uh, the one thing that we've noticed is that if your teen is spending time with another teen, they're probably having more things in common than you might think. Because the number one reason that teens form friends is the common number of things they have, the things they have in common. And uh, generally speaking, if they have more things in common, a stronger friendship is likely to emerge. If you think about this, most of our friends are like that too. We, we consider people friends when we have more things in common, with them, more beliefs in common, more values in common, with them, more feelings that are in common, with them, more experiences that are in common. With them. And so as these things, these common elements add up, um, it's, it's probably, uh, we, we've noticed this a lot, when a parent will say something like, oh, my kid's not like that, he doesn't or she doesn't believe in those things. Uh, we, we raise them to be different. If they're spending time with another kid, they have things in common. And so it's probably better to realize that another way that peers will influence them is not changing their beliefs, but the fact that they would share some common elements uh, would, would increase that friendship. To, to kind of ignore that uh, would be ignoring, you know, a basic uh, fact that's been shown in many, many studies. Uh, the second thing is that people form friendships when they spend more and more time together. And so it could be sitting next to each other in a classroom. You could be sitting next to each other at lunch. You could be on the same team. Those common touch points increase friendships. And again, there's studies show that when students have beliefs in common, feelings and attitudes in common with another person, and they have common touch points with somebody, that person's more likely to become an important social contact. So just to summarize, the two things that we're going to see and talk about for tips are how to address uh, common elements in, in friends and, and, and that form of peer influence. And then also the other idea is where, you, where your team might think more uh, risky behaviors go on than it actually is. So these are elements of, of peers and peer influence that are really kind of important for parents to think about ways to address. So let's get to our tips then. For parents or uh, dealing with peer pressure. The first thing is that you can't really, you know, you, you, you can't teach your kids about who they're going to be friends with. Those things are going to happen a little organically because they're going to come in contact with people and they're going to share beliefs. And as they come in contact with other kids more and they share more beliefs, they're more likely to form friendships to the extent they have things in common. What you can do, instead of having them identify one group of friends that they spend a lot of time with and they have a lot of things in common, what you could do is you can encourage your kids to have multiple peer groups. And when I say multiple peer groups, it would be wise to try and have multiple peer groups where they're gonna get exposed to different kids in each of the different peer groups. So they don't want to have multiple peer groups where they play soccer with the same kids that they play basketball with, that they play baseball with or softball or something like that, or volleyball. You know, that's not going to give, that's going to give multiple groups, but they're going to be the same people in those groups. Maybe it's uh, to, to get them to be part of one group that might be around athletics, another group that might be around uh, doing well in school, another group that might be outdoors, another group that might be around music or arts or something like that. In other words, having them come in contact with different kinds of kids at different groups. And that would be a really good way to, to help reduce the impact or influence of any one group. So if one group is gonna to go to a party and they're gonna do risky things and your kid doesn't wanna do it, 
if they only have one group of friends, it's going to be really hard not to do that. If they have multiple groups of friends, they can kind of not go out with that one group on that night, but still other people they could spend time with. And so it's, it's, it's kind of important that you can consider trying to encourage them to, gain, to do activities where they're going to come in contact with different groups of friends. And that way, again, if, they, if there's one group that might be doing riskier things, they, don't have, they can go against that group and still have friendships and social life. But I, that's, a, that's a really important tip that we share with parents. So that's something that you can do. Encourage multiple friend groups, okay? And encourage them to, to engage with those multiple friend groups. The second way that you can try and reduce the impact of negative, influence, negative peer influences is make your home the place where the friends want to come and stay. And you could do that by, uh, you know, my, my wife will talk about this and she'll say, food's really important. If you feed your teens, they'll come. And so I'm not encouraging food to be the only mechanism, but you want your home to be the place where they socialize, they gather, they want to spend time there. And the way to do that is to um, get to know your, your friends, uh, your, your teens' friends. And so if you, get to know, if you get to know them and you welcome them into your home and you say things like, you're welcome in my home anytime, that's going to make them feel more comfortable. And if you set up an environment where they can have a little bit of quiet space, you can, you can supervise that quiet space uh, a little bit. I think that helps as well. And so, make, so the second tip is make your home a place where your teen and your friends want to be. Uh, make it warm, make it welcoming, uh, encourage activities like food or dinners or movie nights or things like that that'll make your home a special place for your kids and their friends. And, and that has an opportunity for you then in your home and your home's values to have an influence as well as a pyramid. And, and we notice that in kids who have strong parental influences um, the peer influences are not as are not as strong so that's the second tip and then the third tip getting around the idea of supervision okay there's different kinds of monitoring and some monitoring is a little bit more effective than others for reducing peer influence um, so i want to talk about one form today that's called active monitoring and this is different than anything you're going to read about as far as helicopter parenting goes. This is just active monitoring. So let's take a scenario where your teen is going to go visit and spend some time at a friend's house at, uh, at night. Kids are going to go, well, I'm going over so-and-so's house tonight, and uh, we're going to do this. So you know where they are, and you kind of know what they're doing. What you don't know, and this is the part of the active monitoring, is whether it's going to be adult present or not. And so one of the things we encourage parents to do is to engage in active monitoring. So if they say, I'm going out, say, where are you going? Who are you going to be with? And give me the name of the parent who's going to be there and the parent's phone number. So I could just, you know, give them a call and see if they need anything. Thank them and give them a call. A lot of times, students, teens, will say, oh, no, no, you know, that's too much. It's too much. It's not too much. Trust but verify. That's the key. And that's active monitoring. And we see that with active monitoring, kids are less influenced by peers, less, less things. So oftentimes we encourage parents to say, okay, we're, you know, tell us where you're going, who you're going to be with, and then give us, write down the name of the parent and the phone number so we can get a hold of the parent. Just in case something happens to us, we have to call your contact, you know, we'll do that. So oftentimes parents think, because my kid has a cell phone, I don't have to do that. Well, that's the difference between monitoring and active monitoring. And all you're doing is saying, give me the name and the number of that. And one more step to the active monitoring that really helps reduce this is, if you change your plans, be sure to text us where you are, who you're with, name of parent, phone number. And that's really important uh, at times because we've had parents come back and say to us, you know, it's interesting, Dr. Tracy, when we've done that, 
how many times the plans change. And instead of going over that friend's house on, on Friday night, they end up at our house on Friday night. And they smile because they notice that the plans change because likely is that there probably wasn't going to be an adult present at the time. And that's important to have that adult uh, present in the area in the house. So, so uh, let's summarize that, the, that there's different ways that teens form friendships. And one of the ways that they form friendships is common, common beliefs and, and common uh, touch points where they're gonna be in the same club, same meeting, same things. And the way to counter that is to have diverse groups with different values, different beliefs, so again, you're, if your kid gets exposed to a risky group, your kid has a chance to be able to socialize with other kids and not know in that particular group. The other one is recognizing that teens commonly overestimate uh, the number of people doing things. And if they think it's normal, they're going to seek out opportunities. So making your home a place where teens want to go allows you to kind of supervise your monitor. And then if you supervise a monitor, active monitoring, where you get the name of the adult and the phone number. And if the plans change, that you're brought into the loop on uh, the name of an adult and the phone number that's gonna be there to supervise. And with that, you're reducing a large portion of the potential of, of negative peer influence. And so uh, for those of you who have caught the other ep episodes of Coffee with Rob, thank you very much for, for telling us. Tell your friends, tell other parents, um, these are helpful. Uh, for, for you, right, this might be your first one. I encourage you to consider kind of peeking at the other ones. And uh, anytime you get the opportunity, go grab a, a copy of the Mad Power Parents uh, for high schoolers and middle schools. A lot of really good information in those uh, materials that will help you, just like the tips we're having today. Thank you. Bye now.